we are here to bring you everything and anything surrounding Porsche. I'm Mike. I'm Aaron. And this is P-Car Talk. Welcome to another episode of P-Car Talk. I'm Mike. And I'm Aaron. And we got a great show for you guys today. We just got back from driving the 996 Turbo, right? Oh, yeah, we did. Uh, that'll wake you up. Uh, a friend of ours, we reviewed that car. That'll be coming out. Um, I don't know. You'll see it on a Friday at some point, um, depending on when this podcast airs. So <laughs> That's true. It's going to be on some Friday. So what we're going to talk about today, um, I know we've talked about the Type 64, but an article came out yesterday about it that kind of poked some holes in it, and it's kind of an interesting topic, so we'll talk about that. Okay. Also, um, interesting. another interesting topic, EV conversions, meaning on older cars, converting EV stuff, so that's great. We'll recap what happened with the PCAR Club uh, members meeting on the Tuesday night on the live feed, what we went over, uh, what we ended up giving out, and then what's coming up for the next one as far as the giveaway goes. Yep. Um, we'll discuss that and the sponsor that's sponsoring that. And then uh, they released the base Carrera, right? So we'll yeah. talk a little bit about that as Finally. well, the 992. Yeah, interesting. Um, interesting numbers on that car, so a uh, good topic for debate. And then... Uh, We'll close out with uh, some YouTube updates and things like that, let you know what's going on there. So let's go ahead and get started. So Type 64, um, if you guys don't know, this is that thing that looks like the space the, shuttle. The spaceship. Um, interesting thing that Bloomberg wrote in a report on this, and uh, Miss Hannah is <laughs> the one who wrote this article. I was going to ask, but then I was like, maybe I won't ask. Well, she's but... the only one who writes any automotive for Bloomberg. So if you ever hear anyone off at referencing anything automotive Bloomberg, I think she's the writer on it. So. Um, yeah. Anyway, she's not the highlight of the story. What the highlight of this story is actually what she wrote. Um, and what she ended up writing was actually rather interesting. Um, so this vehicle essentially was developed before Porsche existed. No, oh, wow. It's like one of those pre, pre, pre prototypes. Yeah, it's like a decade before Porsche existed. Hmm. But yet this is being calling a port. They're calling it a Porsche. So hmm. the interesting thing. So the title of our article is essentially, is, is this really a Porsche, you know, in a sense. Um, so they're predicting arms, predicting this thing's going to go up for $20 million, probably, okay. you know, give or take two, two or my, you know, two plus, plus SD. Minus, yeah whatever is on that. But, um, the point of that is, is like I said, it's, it was constructed 10 years prior to Porsche even existing as a brand. Now, Ferdinand Porsche mm -hmm. did make this car, but didn't make it under the Porsche crest, didn't make it under the Porsche yeah. brand. Um, and she also stated, which is a good point. A lot of people consider the first Porsches are Gamun Porsches made yep. in Gamun, Germany. This was predates all of that. So then, if it, I mean, if nobody cares about that and then still considers it Porsche, yeah, where does the value of the Gaboon Porsches go? Yeah, I know. I didn't even think about that, but I thought the interesting thing is Porsche AG is on board with this thing still being call, called a Porsche. So well, it's pretty cool looking. Yeah, but I mean, could it could it just be? mislabeled all of these years i guess that's kind of what i wanted to bring up i mean it's kind of interesting in the sense yeah. of we're all calling it a porsche we all have been told it's been being called a porsche it's being paraded around as a porsche but mm. you know she does bring up a good point in this article of saying well is it really a porsche though i mean i, I is it just a coach me, built car the the thought process that was I built by to, somebody who maybe went on to do porsche I was thinking of it like uh, maybe it's like early stages of like prototype, like something drawn on a napkin. Does it still count as the same thing as it's their design, their car? Yeah. Maybe it wasn't. But it's not even me calling whatever. it. It's really a, a prototype. You know, it's type 64. Granted, you know, it's not saying, yep. you know, prototype 64 or whatever. But I just think it's kind of. I don't of, know how you bring it into the brand, I guess. Yeah. I, I, and I think that. She brought she brings up a lot of like good points about it in the article and should this get a pass in your opinion is this okay? Mm, I, mean, I mean I don't I mean it is a race car after all right yeah of sorts. But I mean it would be almost kind of more of a coach built car by 
Ferdinand Porsche, right? Like, like a Pinaferina more, design yeah, car that would type thing. More, like a designer-esque. Type, yeah, more that than, would make more sense calling it that than it would be Porsche. More than Porsche itself was like, we're commissioning this car. Yeah, and it didn't exist. Yeah. Porsche didn't exist. Yeah. But I, yet... I maybe, don't think it's a Porsche then. Then maybe because they've just adopted it. Because granted, we talked before that this car exists and they have one in at the Porsche Museum. Mm -hmm. So is that saying, okay, since it's there, are they saying that claiming it, even though, you know, they didn't exist as a company and they're saying maybe because the lineage of who the company that started, the guy who started the company built that car. Mm -hmm. So we're connecting the dots saying that that's ours. And we don't even know what, um, what he had to say to begin with. I mean, I'm sure this Type 64 is, is, has been around forever. Oh, yeah. I mean, so that could have been something that he implemented way before it passed. It was like, hey, this is something I did. We're still going to bring it under. This is still the Type 64 is Porsche. Yeah, I know. I, I, I... But nobody's going to know that now. I mean, I guess there's there has to be some type of documentation somewhere along the line. Mm hmm. I mean, is it, it's not VIND or anything, right? It's just what it is. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know all those details, to there's be no, completely honest no, with you, but I, no I, 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 yeah, no. I hardly doubt that there's any kind of VIN code back then. They probably just made things to make them. I'm sure there <laughs> isn't. There it is. Yeah, exactly. They weren't <laughs> like, oh, okay, well, I need to stamp something in this to prove it's, you know, I don't think it was, it was so early on in car building. And then this thing being, you know, handcrafted and actually designed for, for you know, a, ra a road race and and that's why it looks the way it ends up looking but I, I just thought it was an interesting article to bring up that she talked about that because to me it really it predates Porsche so mm -hmm. granted he's the one who built it it's just an interesting what do you what do you really call this a you chicken know? and egg type thing yeah. Yeah. well I don't even know what's that like I, it we know, like in the chicken and the oh, egg. We do. I guess we do know yeah. that it was before the yeah, brand. Yeah, the chicken and the egg thing still, is kind of one the... of those things. It's like we know this car predated the brand. Yep. So maybe maybe the, the correct terminology behind it isn't really Porsche. Yep. Maybe like you said, it's more prototype. This is predates Porsche. So mm -hmm. it's more of kind of this is the idea of what all of the – 356 and if I had a company, kind of came from yeah like if i had a company and it was a brand and you know it was then this is what i want it to be yeah but i mean it's still you know what it's still part of their story whether or not it's porsche as a brand yeah it's porsche as the person that started it yeah i can tell you this much i mean i'm sure you've all seen the commercial out there and you have too they're parading this around oh, it's yeah. like like their car i mean it was in their top five yeah so you know with Patrick Long and all that guy, and these guys taking pictures with the car and supporting the car and it, you, this thing is going to you know bring record money at RM under the Porsche name and I guess at this point like it's it's a Porsche whether you want it to be or not it is it is one I mean you can argue all you want but the fact that, that maybe they adopted it and they they reeled it in maybe maybe you know initially I still think it's, it's going to bring, I mean, since they have accepted it, it'll go to auction, it'll bring money, then I think it'll devalue some of the Kamun cars because those are always considered those super early, early cars. But then it might not because they have a different racing lineage. Than, yeah, I kind of disagree with that because you know? those are their own things. You know, I, I don't think this, because it's going on to market and it's pre-date, I don't think there's any kind of correlation or any kind of impact or ripple effect without the brand this thing is so one-off it's so just different that it's just okay it's a it's a blip on the radar it shows okay. up and then it disappears you know it's one of those things that somebody paid a lot of money for and it's a gee whiz thing and not that it's not an important car but i think that the fact that some very wealthy collector is going to have this car and it's going to get displayed and it's it's going to live somewhere where people can go oh hey that's great Good for you, you know. And <laughs> look what I got. Exactly, yeah. and you know, and and guys like us now, or anybody who's listening, can if you ever meet that guy, you can be like, well, technically, it's not a Porsche. And you'd be like, what are you talking about? I paid twenty five million dollars for that car. It is a Porsche. <laughs> but um, 
yeah, I, I, you know, tell us what you guys think in the comments uh, when you when we uh, when you listen to this because I, I would be interested to hear what what the fan base says about this mm-hmm. because I'm kind of torn. There, that does make sense to me that it's predating Porsche. Is it technically a Porsche? I mean, just because it was made by Porsche, even though Porsche didn't exist, so did everything that he touched become Porsche? Not necessarily. Remember, he built he made the Beetle. That's yeah. Volkswagen so then, Group. So now are they bringing... So those are Porsches? Yeah, but they also tell that story. That's also in the museum, too. No, I know, so I know, I know. I think, I think again, I think they're just trying to wrap anything that what... I, you're right, things, you're spot on, that anything he did touch, they have kind of brought in like, well, here's, yeah. what, here's how we started. Yeah, and and it does tell a history line, which is interesting, but... um. So let's transition. So let so speaking of that, old cars, okay. Yep. So now we're still on the old car topic. Um, EV West, I don't know if anybody out there uh, knows who they are, but they're everybody out in the California area probably should know who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, they're an electric conversion company. They convert, essentially their specialty is not just old cars, but generally older cars um, to electric conversion. They take the combustion engines out of them. They, they put the electric motors in. They put the batteries in and things like that. And um, th- this is not a new thing. They've been doing yep. this for a while. But so I think some, one of the interesting things is just mo- more recently they did a 912. Okay. And then they put a, a Tesla Model S battery motor, like as many as they could. Obviously, you Man, can't have the same you amount. Get some space. You know, the way the car is laid out or designed. Um, and they put that in that car, and that's kind of in the buzz right now. And, you know, that car has 550 horsepower. And I don't even know how this is a fathomable number. But this is what they're claiming. It's 4,500 uh, 4, foot pounds of torque. I mean, I know electric motors produce a lot of torque, but I yeah. guess it's. Anyways, I, I don't even want to talk about that. Talk, like the numbers. That's not what I, what the whole reason why I brought <laughs> this up. It's like a newt meters. It's some weird. Yeah, mass it's some weird conversion or something of that nature. But I think the interesting thing about it is, is. Granted, like I said, they haven't, this isn't a new thing. They've been doing this for a while, but we have, we haven't talked about this topic as far as taking a classic Mm. and turning it into an EV car. I mean, what are your thoughts on something like that? Is that, is that blasphemous? Is that something that's new age and cool? Well, is that something, you know, that you could see yourself doing or my, my first initial thoughts would be that may be a way if the if the gas motors were banned mm-hmm. that you could still have at least a bit of a classic feel and still be able to drive your car on the yeah. roads if that if it comes to that uh, otherwise I just feel like you're losing a lot of the soul of what absolutely right what that car is going to be the sound the feels that, there's all those elements that that go en- with that that encompass that that experience I agree. Um, so, you know, a little bit of more numbers on this. It says some of the, some of the conversions that EV West is doing cost about a hundred thousand dollars, but they're saying that this particular 912 kit can go for about 50,000 and it's got about 140 miles of range. Um, that's good range. Yeah. It's decent range, you know, as far as like, I guess I'm trying to paint a picture here so I can, you know, you're living in a moment. So you're trying to picture how this car could, you know, effectively operate and live yep. so i'm thinking maybe if you live in california and you live in a place like you you mentioned maybe you're being forced but you like the looks of a classic car um and you have a commute and you live you live outside of the city and maybe this works for you yeah, maybe and then with it i mean uh, did they all have tesla guts um I didn't talk about that. I think they have their own models of stuff okay. too as well. I was going to say you could probably use those Tesla charging stations and stuff yeah. like that if that was the case. There's kind of a built-in infrastructure. Yeah, and I, and I don't think that the, the charging thing would maybe be a big deal with this car. I think mm. the whole, you know, this is a point A to point B car. Okay. So I, especially with the... With <laughs> we just, the we're going here and we're coming back. Yeah, yeah, I think with the mileage, I don't think this is a point, you know, A to F, you know, bounce around town type of situation. I think this is more of kind of, Hey, you want to drive a 1968, 912 and maybe you live in a city that's going to ban, you know, um, combustion engines at some point and you still want to drive this car. So then you convert it over and then you end up driving this car back and forth to work. Now it's giving you a lot of the feels, the smell, the feels, you know, obviously the sounds are gone on the shifting, but I mean, this thing, 
I, I don't know if anyone else has seen, you don't necessarily need to clutch this car yeah, so you, you could wouldn't. sit in yeah. traffic. That's not how the motors work, but there are, is a yeah. gearing system, but you don't have to clutch an electric motor. So is this going to get more common, you think? Is uh. this kind of, and, and to their claim of the article, and, and this is an EV West claim, but where I pulled this from was saying that they have a, an extensive waiting list, not necessarily to do this to Porsches, yeah. But just in general, with like all types of cars, they're doing this well, to MGs, they're doing this to Fiats, they're doing this to old Volkswagen Beetles. I mean, you name it, they're doing it. I mean, I see it a uh, uh, couple of things. I see it as like a new way to hot rod something, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe a little future proofing if we're if you're thinking ahead of time. Yeah. Also, everybody's got a Tesla. Yeah. So yeah, oh, I have an EV car too, and it's not a Tesla. Yeah. You're you're being a little different. And then what made me kind of giggle to myself, I guess, was thinking about everybody with it, with these cars going in the canyons and it'd just be whisper quiet. <laughs> yeah, but I, I honestly don't think that that would this would inspire people to do canyon driving with this car. I'm not saying it's not possible. It's a 912. I mean. But you just don't know what. I don't think that they're thinking about engineering you think, balance you think, you think just, when this car is being okay. made you with the batteries. You think it's just total utility, total tool. Well, well, like, well, I think it has to be because there's only so many places you can put a battery in a 912. Mm-hmm. And it might not be the most efficient area or balance-oriented place to place a battery. So if, that, if you're talking about now running through the canyons or doing something to that, to that effect, yeah. and your nose heavy now, I mean, what is that going to create for you? That's a good question. Exactly. So I think that, again, I think this is a point A to point B car. This is not a a fine tooled Swiss army knife where you can go to work, then you can go up to the Hills. I don't think that's what this is. I think this is a, okay, you want to pop in and you still need to go work your corporate job or wherever you're working or you're hipster fresh and you need to go downtown to your, whatever you own. Mm -hmm. And maybe they hook up AC in this or maybe they don't, whatever, but now you're doing it all, um, green you know, you're saving the planet, you're doing all those type of things. This leads me to back to all the stuff we've talked about before, though, with Electrify America and all this other stuff. Like, maybe, is there going to be a real market for this over time? Like, when everybody, all these manufacturers are making these really good EV cars that are compliant, that are, the QC is good in them. Like, does this have a place anymore? Mm -hmm. It's still a specialty, though. That's what I would say. I mean, yeah, it's still I mean, it's different. niche brand. I agree with that. It's niche. But at the same time, I mean, is it really maybe you're giving I, I just think that you're probably giving up a lot just going that way. Like why? Why even? I don't know. I guess I have a hard time wrapping my head around that topic. Well, I mean, I don't know that I would buy one, but I no, I, I, know, just, I know. I just see that that like anything, any of the hot rod market that still exists. I mean, it's it's of that similar style. It's just different from the norm. Yes, there are cars currently. If you just want to, the same point, and petrol, mm-hmm. there are cars that do it better on so many fronts, and people are still going to an older form of technology here and there. Yeah, but or this, a different form. But this is forward technology yeah, in an so. older vehicle. So basically, you're taking current, like current or for, too, yeah. current or forward technology, putting that in that car to do that. And is it just a fad too, you know, like, is it one of those things where it's like, it's, it's fresh right now just because there's not a lot of them. But when the market gets flooded with tons of EV cars, is it still niche at that point? Because now you flip, let's flip the coin over for a second. Let's say it's going to take a long time to get this way, but let's just pretend we're there now. 50% of the cars driving around on the roads, regardless, they're not classics, but they're, they're EV cars. Hmm. So now, does it make it niche to have a combustion engine car and a classic? I guess so. Because now, oh, well, yeah, oh, that's cool. It's EV, you know, in that car. But it's, so is every other car out here. Yours is just old. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. And and, uh, I was thinking, too, uh, with, like, any technology, how fast that's going to be old. Yeah. Whatever they're using. I mean, are you going to go to the same company and get it upgraded the next I'm sure they probably have a business model for that. <laughs> Next year, I'm sure or so. they do. I'm sure they have a business model for that. I mean, they've 
and, and I'm not knocking them at all. I just thought it was an interesting topic. We haven't discussed it yet. We've talked a lot about EV technology, especially with forthcoming newer cars, but we haven't talked about any older cars. I mean, can you not only a 912, I mean, I'm sure you could do this with pretty much anything you want to do. Could you see like they could probably do with a 914? Yeah, that's, you know, a, that's kind of what I thought. I think that would be kind of... You know, you think about the space yeah. that you have in a 914 to store batteries from a balance like front, frunk, and trunk area where you could put batteries maybe. And it's like shaped balance. like a battery, yeah, square. Kind of, yeah. Um, you know, I think I'm a, I, I'm still mindsetted in the old times and I just think that this doesn't really have a place for me. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. My, my opinion's not... It's an opinion. It's not the right one. It's not the wrong one. It's just an opinion. But I, I just, w- what's your opinion on this? I think it'd be cool to have one. Yeah. I think it'd be cool. To, I don't know that. I mean, it would be cool to have one. Like, I have one of those, but then I still have a combustion motor version. Yeah. If, if that was possible. I, I mean, there's all kind of benefits to it. I could see tooling around in this, I guess. I mean, I'm not totally against the idea of it. I guess. I don't know. I guess I'm so such a emotional type of guy as far as like wearing my emotions on my sleeves and, and that what like we drove one, we drove mm-hmm. the car today, just yeah. like that sensation of sound and speed. And we had that discussion after we drove the 996 Turbo where we talked about like if the car was dead silent, like kind of like a, a stock version. And that's not even dead silent, but we're just saying dead yeah. silent compared to the car that we drove that had straight pipes on it does it invoke the same emotion that you have even with the sensation of speed that you're going down the road? Are you still, you know, excited? Are you still hooting and hollering? I, yeah. I, I think the answer is no. So I think it does, it does take away a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So this thing now turns into an aesthetically pleasing thing to look at, but from a driving standpoint probably becomes very numb. Yeah, and it and it to be and as, and like it goes said, against everything yeah. a many Porsche enthusiasts talk about over like if you're a true enthusiast mm. you don't want a numb experience that's that, why a lot yeah. of people are stuck in the air cooled era and don't even want to leap over to water cooled because they don't want to feel numb <laughs> they don't want a less experience than what they already know exactly yeah. so it just makes you wonder I just thought it was a good topic for debate let us know in the comments guys what you think about that particular car so moving on. Let's recap the uh, the P Car Club meeting. Yep, great experience, right? It was a Tuesday night. Yeah, it was good times. Yeah, burned the barn down, um, but it was a great one. We talked some of the topics we talked about. We talked about uh, the speeds, uh, Seinfeld speedster. I know it was an older topic, but we wanted to hear engagement and what everybody thought. You know, that was on the chat, yep. and that worked out really well. Um, we talked about the most uh, best bang for your buck with Porsche, which one you could currently buy. Um, and then we also talked about hypercar racing in 2021 that EMSA is basically making that class again. And then we gave away the really rare 917 shirt that was developed yeah. to a, a lucky person out there. And um, that was awesome. So how do you win this cool stuff, right? So you got to become a P-Car Club member. Yeah, how do you participate in this? So go to pcarclub.com right now. I'll wait and pause. But in all seriousness, you need to go there, um, knock that out. Uh, it's under virtual membership, and become a part of the the, the conversation, right? Like what, yeah. w- and you know, mingle and everybody else is chatting with each other, not just with us on the chat. Yeah. And then you win cool stuff too, right? And then with your membership, depending on which one you elect, you're going to end up getting a club shirt, club decals, and now with the RS annual membership, you're going to get a medal. Uh, membership card, yep. right? Where it's going to say P Car Club on it and RS member. So not like a laminated yeah, card for membership. Yeah, cool. like an actual metal card. Like if, think AMX black, you know, yep. card essentially, but this is going to be stainless. Um, so you just have to go on, sign up. Um, so this month's sponsor is far it is sponsoring the actual giveaway, not for the actual podcast, but he is sponsoring the, the membership giveaway yep. is uh, Kevin Lynch. And the Wolfpack 901. Wolfpack. Yeah. So if you guys don't know what the Wolfpack 901 is, basically it's uh, a group that they've gotten together where it's a fundraising group and they help place younger people in apprenticeships in an air-cooled uh, mechanic shop, right? So they do some vetting process. People apply. They work with uh, you know independent air-cooled places around you know, all over the U.S., not just in California. And that's where their home base is at. And what they end up doing is you know, putting a person in that's a good fit and that can learn. And they also pay them while they do that from this foundation. 
So they basically are tra- training them in a skill set so they can continue on and be these guys that are helping working on these cars because it's a dying art. And Kevin saw, you know, this down the road long time ago that there's a big gap there. There's nobody learning how to do these things. And all the older guys are retiring and they're not doing it anymore. And there's a huge gap there. So he saw a need in the market to actually make that happen. And that's when he created this foundation. So it's a great foundation. I'm glad we're partnering with them and they're supplying basically what would you call it? Like a wallet holder and a key holder. Yeah, it's like a key, it it's goes like on a, your desk yeah. or it goes in your front like foyer when you first come mm-hmm. in. It's like a tray and it's got the actual, actual factory Pepita yep. insert inside. So that's from the Porsche factory. They had that made and then it's all leather bound on the outside. It looks really cool. It's freaking amazing. If you end up winning that, that will pay for your RS annual membership because that thing costs more than an RS oh, annual yeah, membership, yeah, yeah. hands down. So that's how awesome that giveaway is. And yeah. we're so thankful that Kevin is a good friend of ours and he wants to be part of what we're doing. And we want to try to give back and we want to try to bring, you know, knowledge to his foundation. And additionally, you know, we're going to try to work with some of our local independents to see if we can get some young people placed in there. So yeah. everybody helping everybody. So it's such a great thing. But uh, I bring that up because I know I've been asked already. It's the beginning of the month and people are already asking us you know, what's going to be this month's giveaway. Cause it's pretty yeah. exciting. So it's we'll be, our, it's on our Instagram. Yeah. We'll be teasing it up on Instagram multiple times, yeah. you know, to give shed a lot of light on this. But, um, again, you know, if, if you're interested in, you know, donating to the wolf pack, you know, reach out to them. They have a website. Um, I'm sure they would love to take your donation yep. you and can uh, buy decals and all kinds of stuff. To absolutely. Well. So it's such a great program, such a great guy. The dude is a total legend. Yeah. Um, Kevin's cool. Yeah. Really, really great guy. But um, again, that's one of the some of the stuff that's going on right now. Um, let's take a quick break, and then we will come back and talk about uh, the base Carrera. Thank you guys listening to PCAR Talk so much. Uh, we appreciate you guys so 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 much. I can't say that enough. Um, please go to PCARTalk.com and check that out. Um, we have a virtual membership on there. Um, we are on there on Tuesdays, meeting with you guys. Um, become a virtual member. We would solely, solely appreciate that so, so much. Um, also check us out on YouTube. Um, we release videos on Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays, um, help support the channel. Um, everything we're doing is trying to bring the community closer together. We definitely appreciate that. Also, when you go on the YouTube, um, you know, if you could subscribe, maybe pass it along, make a comment. We really appreciate that. Um, again, circling back to pcartalk.com. Um, there is a newsletter created on there. Uh, please put your information in there. That way we can keep you up to date on anything that's coming forward and anything that we're going to be doing uh, moving forward and all the exciting things that are coming out. And again, the virtual membership is on pcartalk.com. Now back to the show. All right, guys, we are back from break. Um, so we're going to talk about the base Carrera that has been released and numbers on it are official. Pricing is official. So let's go over some stats on it, right? So 379 horsepower. It's still going to be the three liter um, yep. turbo car. Um, they're all wide body cars now. There are no narrow bodies, 992s in existence anymore. That is a thing of the past. They don't do that anymore. Everything it gets wide bodied. So uh, is it just a body now, not wide body? Or yeah, I guess good <laughs> point, right? Because they don't have any. They don't have anything to compare it against. So yep. it's not going to be narrow body versus wide body. It's just going to be the new nine body it. style. That's yeah. it. So price point is going to be starting at ninety eight k and going up from there. Zero to sixty numbers stuff you guys can read, but I'm going to go ahead and regurgitate it for you. Uh, zero to sixty without the sports chrono is going to be four seconds with sports chrono three point eight. Pretty quick. So does the sport chrono a sport? The sport button is that the sport package? Yeah, the sports okay. chrono package, okay. I think. So, you know, it's going to be under four seconds if you end up getting that. I'm sure the addition to that on the 98,000 is going to push you pretty probably 110. Yeah, probably. If not more. Uh, so, it's a pretty quick car for a base Carrera, though, right? It is. Um, I, I think it's pretty interesting. So, you know, now with the Carrera S to compare it to, uh, the Carrera S is 480 horsepower. That's a big jump, it seems like, yeah. Yeah. 
No, no, I'm sorry. Not that, that, that number. I, I, I put that number down. Oh, I know why I put that number down. So forgive me. Well, I put that number down because I wanted to compare it to basically what we talked about before with the exhaust. Oh, okay, the, tune. yeah, the tunes. Okay. So you get about a hundred horsepower. So that was going to say that could put this base Carrera right around 400, this car at okay. 480. Yeah. If you put an exhaust and a tune on this car. So think about that for a minute. So the base Carrera could have 480 horsepower. If you do those things that I just mentioned, that is pretty stout. Yeah, that's 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 a lot of power. Kind of makes you wonder why would you buy the S if this has the same bones? It has the wide body because they're both wide bodies. Well, I mean, you, you would think that you'd be able to tune that one just a little bit further from where it's at, but then maybe not. Maybe though, but why? How, what way? It's going to be the same power plant. It's like Porsche's not going to. The motors are the same. It's a three liter. Yeah, and it's just a different tune, like you said. So, it's probably yeah. just detuned. I mean, I'm sure there's some more specifics, air box location, maybe exhaust. But if you if you do the R&D and you figure it out, anyways, the point is, is that <laughs> yeah. probably with a little bit more of a juice tune, yep. you could be at 500 horsepower with this car. I think there's going to be a radical shift in the market, in my opinion, if you are smart <laughs> and yep. you would just buy the base Carrera because why, what's the incentive of buying the S at this point, except the so paying there's up, not really other middle, than saying you yeah, have the S not really a middle market, except that they had some accessories. Exactly. That you like, can't get. And granted, there's still going to be plenty of people who want to buy that foofy crap out there and they want the S model and that's it. And that's what it's going to be. Mm. But the, I, I think the enthusiasts entry point, if you're, Granted, now most of the people probably listening to this, I you know I can't say because we don't really ask that those kind of questions as far as demographic or what people would pay. But I would imagine even that price point at ninety eight thousand, that's still a lot of money. Yeah. However, you know if you think about if you did buy the base and then you took maybe twelve grand out of your pocket and you put and you got one hundred and ten in this car, you could probably get about five hundred horsepower out of it. And you're not even near the base, yeah. uh, the Carrera S price. Exactly. So. so that's a pretty stout thing. I mean, so let's talk about this for a second. I know we discussed it before. Um, do you think that's a good price point, the entry point on this $98,000? Well, it's not 100 so that's always good. Yeah, and I think that's just for marketing purposes, <laughs> right? Yeah, and like we we think with a lot of different cars, I I don't think that I think that ninety eight is a good number, mm -hmm. but I don't think it'll be. I mean, that's a no options, no no frills, no thrills type of car. Yeah, are you gonna find one with nothing on it? Yeah, that's a good point. You don't really. I didn't really read or what what the base mm -hmm. options are like what it comes with. As far as saying, okay, these are the no additional option That's probably, pricing. It's probably not the non-LED headlights. It's probably the, those those things like that. True. But could you, if you did go base and you really did skimp on a lot of that stuff, could you really option out maybe the infotainment? Like, so are, essentially, are you making your own lightweight car if oh. you go that way? I can't remember saying. A little, See where I'm going? RS America action. Yeah. Are you making your own lightweight car because of that? You're not getting all the heavy stuff in the car? I and maybe know. not getting some of the, the fancy suspension stuff. Maybe you're not getting PASM. Mm -hmm. Possibly. So. Yeah. I, I don't know what's standard now mm -hmm. with what comes out with the car, but I, I think it's interesting nevertheless. I, I, how well do you think these are going to do? Do you think these are going to do pretty good? Well, it's new. Everybody, I mean, I think that's one of the. I think, think there's the always a, a buyer, right? Like the yep. the kind of people that are always flipping cars to get the newer car. Yeah. So I think there's going to be a thing. wave of those people that end up with this car, and it's going to be the new sexy thing. Cause Living it's, on the block. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I think it's going to be one of those things, but I think it'll do well. It should. So do you think that the that you're thinking about the market shift? So do you think people are just going to be buying the turbo and the and the base Carrera? And then leaving the S alone. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I say that because we're we're tapped in. Yeah. But you know, not not to. This is gonna sound really bad, but like as far as like mass market appeal with stuff, mm -hmm. people believe it or not, just don't do the research you think they would do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we, they see don't, what I'm they, saying? Like, you, you like, think that the that would yeah. be an it, 
you know, the low hanging fruit. That's an obvious decision for this. guys like us. Yep. But then there's a lot of people that just go in and like, I want the Carrera S because the Carrera S is the Carrera S. Yeah, and it already has more. It's already more powerful than this car yeah. and that car. And they don't Way do more, bro. <laughs> Way more, bro, Mo Sapien. And they don't have to do anything but says get it and drive it. Yeah. And and there's always a demographic for people like that, right? And then there's always people like, well, if it's an S, it's going to sell for more. And and then there's a sales tactic behind that too for salesmen. They're like, well, you don't want the base because no one's going to want the base. And, da, 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 and yada, yada, yada. But there's going to be probably plenty of people who want the base out there. I mean, if, again, tunability with turbocharged engines, we talked about this before. It's really where do you, where do you want to feel safe at? Because yeah. you can tune the crap out of them and be you know go nuts and pop the motor real fast, or you could be safe and get a safe tune out of them. And just remember, they're, you're getting the mass market tune, right? You're getting yeah. the I don't want to touch it from the manufacturer tune because I don't want to see you in service while it's under warranty tune. <laughs> yes, I want to see you outside. outside exactly. Of warranty. Yeah. You're getting the I want I want you to come to us when it's out of warranty mm-hmm. tune. So, I mean, you know, take that for what you will. But I think I think this is going to do well, to be honest with you. And I think that all new 911s do well just because it's a new 911. Yep. Um, and this one's, you know, radically different than the last as far as generation goes and things like that. Um, I almost like would be interested to see, and we're not there yet, so I'm not trying to skip ahead, but what's going to happen after this? If, if because I think right, that's yeah. where the big shift's going to be, in my personal opinion. Do you think because they're going to continue with the when a hybrid comes yeah. in or something, and like that is going to be an interesting dynamic of, holy crap, it, the world just ended. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like uh, the instant torque plus turbos. If they keep the turbos, do you think they're going to keep them, or do you think they're going to do away with that and call it a wear item, where the hybrid parts really may not wear yeah. as easy. That's a great question. Like make up the power. That's a great question. Hybridly I, I think the turbos will probably stay. And the reason why I say that is because in the, uh, the 918 hybrid car that they were racing was a turbo car with an electric motor on it. So granted, it was a, a four cylinder yeah. making that kind of power. But still, that was prototype stuff. It didn't matter. But they were using the electric motor to spool the turbo and always keep it spooled. So maybe that's how they're going to use it, the electric motor, to keep the turbos always up. That way there's never any lag. That way you're turbo spooling at, you know, 1,000 RPM. So you're instant power all the time. So I don't know. And then you tune on the turbos, and then your electric motors get a tune, and then you're... I wonder how, you know, and not to get off on a tangent, but this is a good topic to a segue to talk about it for a second. I didn't plan to talk about this, but since we are already discussing it, what's going to happen when, and I don't know anything about this. So maybe you guys can chime in on the comments and all that kind of stuff. Cause this is an interesting topic. If they do add a hybrid engine into the car and they say they don't put a turbo in it, what's tunability on something like, can you tune in an electric motor? to do more than it's doing Hmm. like, or is that just whatever you get is what you get? Like, is there tunability? You know how like you can screw with an engine and, and turn up the compression ratio or the air fuel mixture because it's a combustion engine, right? Like, can you screw with that electric motor too? Probably. Can you tap into that from, and I know there's a certain, I mean, they all have limits. I would almost imagine that the tunability is where it's at and you, you would have to upgrade the, the motors yeah some, or the battery, some, or the battery or something yeah. right you'd have to get more volts in so you're talking hardware you're not talking software yeah now. i don't know but but again um just technology reference you can uh, if you want to speed things up you might be able to turn up the voltage maybe the voltage is at a safe rate for those yeah batteries. and, and, and a lesser little, wear but they have a little bit yeah more to less go. aware yeah. in it right like essentially overclocking that's what you would do for a pc it was it's a similar thing that you would probably do yeah yeah for the car I just thought it was an interesting topic. Like so I said, I didn't really probably. schedule for us to speak about that, like, and didn't do any R and D on my end. But I just thought it was an interesting segue to talk mm-hmm. since we're talking about this and what the potentials of the Carrera are gonna be at some point. Um, so let's let's play a little game. Like, if you if you were to buy one of these, based off of what you know and and past cars, w- tell me a color spec and how you would spec this car. 
I do. I have been liking blue a lot lately. Okay. That one, uh, the one Macan that we drove, that blue, whatever that Sapphire is. Sapphire blue. Sapphire blue. Okay. That, that'd definitely be the color. Sapphire blue. Okay. Uh, I keep it base because okay. why? You going why in I? PDK or manual? I know you're a PDK guy. Oh, let's not even get started. There. <laughs> That's inside jokes, guys. You have no idea. It's so funny. Should we talk about it briefly? No, I mean, we, let's just say, it. so myself. Throw yourself on the sword oh, so I don't have to throw you I on will. it. Okay. So driving the uh, <laughs> 996 turbo, there was a stage three clutch involved. Wang. It was a, a little a little more touchy than I that I've never experienced stage three clutch uh-huh. like that. So there was a little a bit of getting used to it and Mike about to die and riding passenger because yeah. it's just, it was touchy. I almost stalled it, but you I could didn't. be a little bit more descriptive of what you were, what was, was happening. There was there. a lot of um, jerking around, uh, jerking around a little bit for the for a few times. I did get the hang of it. Gas and go, ga- like yeah. clutching, and yeah, it's a little touchy. Yeah, did I have any issues with that? No, uh, Mike was perfect at it. <laughs> Just making but Mike, sure. But Mike hey. has a background with other things, hey. so it's it's fine. Hey, it is what it is. <laughs> I, and that's where I just wanted to talk about that. It's not to just put fun of there, but like, car. to be fair, it was not an easy clutch to drive. I definitely have a lot of experience with like clutches and that, and that area. Aaron had never driven anything like that. And poor guy was struggling there in first gear. He got the hang of it after about like the fourth or fifth, <laughs> like st- full stop. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Okay. So, so sorry, not, not, metallic. not to get off you know topic. Okay. Base so car. PDK, right? So you oh, don't have man. to shift that'd out of first a, gear. Be a manual car. <laughs> <laughs> Stage one clutch. St- <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Okay. So stage one clutch. Yeah, just go ahead and pince me in for that. Yep. Yeah. I got you dialed sapphire blue. I'm writing it down right yeah. now. Um, I probably, probably, I really don't like maybe the infotainment center upgrades. If there's any, yeah, if there's anything. whatever the tech is there. Yeah, maybe not the Burmeister stuff because that is a little. No, oh, I'm sure you're gonna pay arm and leg for that. Yeah, that was that's pretty pricey. Um, I don't know. I, I don't even the, know. Can you can you option out a sunroof or? I have no. I didn't see. I did go through the configurator the other day. Yeah. I didn't. I don't think know that I saw a delete. Okay, that's a bummer. Um, if you can, then let me know if there's like a secret combination. Yeah. Right. Um, I'd probably go silver wheels. Yep. Because that'd look good. Blue on. Yeah. Silver's going to look great. That would look great. Um, you stick with steel brakes or are you going PCBs? Uh, steel brakes. Cause yeah. everybody, there's no, I don't think PC, I don't, I don't think the ceramics are. Yeah. I agree. Meh. I think it's a cool G whiz thing, but yeah. not the best. I think stopping power is close enough. Yeah. Uh, I don't, for, I don't for, think gonna, for us mortals. Yeah. I don't think I'd be pushing it enough. Yeah. For us mortals. Yeah. I don't think it's going to, you know, I can modulate not crashing into somebody or, or breaking <laughs> because yeah. that car is probably not going to live on the track. Let's be honest. Would you go sports exhaust or would you just not screw with that because you know you're going to end up doing your own I thing? I wouldn't buy a sports exhaust. Yeah, just because I'd probably replace yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Like I, I always recommend that to people. I always, they're like, oh, should I get the sports exhaust? And I said, are you going to pay three or four grand to put your own exhaust on it eventually anyways? Yeah, okay, then no. Yeah, because I mean, you might initially like it. Because it's going exactly. to sound better, but then you might not think it's loud enough. And then now you could have, yeah, saved it and then. Done I, and that's a tough one too, because like you know if if because certain Porsche dealers are very finicky about stuff that mods on cars. Mm-hmm. So I maybe I, I retract that statement. I would figure out whoever I'm buying the car from, and I would make sure that I got that deal signed in blood. If. I could mod the exhaust and I would still be under dealership warranty. Yeah, well, that's true. I didn't and if I that. wasn't, then I probably would get sports exhaust because if I had to be stuck with that At car under warranty yeah. for the entire time without modding the exhaust, then I would definitely be pissed at myself for not getting the sports exhaust yeah. on the car. Mm-hmm. I can see that. So, yeah. So, caveat to that if you guys are out there and you're one of the ones, you know, doing that. So, I, I think it's a pretty good car. Mm hmm. It's a pretty so, like what color interior? You didn't black. say black. Black interior. Well, yeah, uh, I know I said black like like duh, but yeah, black interior. I don't yeah, think I mean I'm sure there's probably some options. You probably could have went like not just tan, but I bet there's cocoa, that, cocoa that, or something that like that. It probably brown, went, yeah. That dark brown we had that was that was a pretty cool color combination with mm-hmm. dark color. I don't know how it would look with blue. Yeah, it might look classy. You never know. Mm-hmm. And but then black, you could probably. then you could go aftermarket and get like you know. Pepita in, inserts or something like that. That would be, be kind of cool. Um, Maybe Porsche are offering that. 
well, I don't think you can do that unless you go like CCX. Yeah. Like that's something super, super special they do. Like so if you're going to do it in-house, like yeah. not to take away from getting it done in-house. Yeah, I, mean, I know everybody likes that stuff on the stat build sheet, but I mean, that's an easy aftermarket thing to do. I did it on the, you know, the 964. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted it didn't come that way, but I, I could really care less. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good, I, that's a good spec. Yeah. I like so, it. So what do you, uh, what's your choices over there? All right. So this particular car, the 992, right? It's kind of a large car. I'm going to kind of shock people with this color combination because usually I like b b like bright colors. Mm -hmm. I feel like since it's a lot of car, I would actually probably try to pick like a polar silver if I could. Mm. I was thinking um, I'd say silver. Yeah. And probably polar silver is going to be an upgraded color. I would probably pay up for it as long as it was reasonable. Like the Sapphire blue, I think was like a seven or $800 upgrade yep. when we saw it on that, uh, the Macan, if that was possible, then I would do that 110%. Um, just because I think this, the silver will help the car blend better. They will. It'll soak up some of that. Yeah. The, the bulbousness of it. Um, now granted, like it's not out of control wide or big, but I'm just saying like I, for, for me visually, I think I would go with like a silver. Um, and I almost would like, I have a vision already before I even bought the car. I'd almost kind of like try to make my version of a touring car with that car okay. with the 992. So I would go, you know, probably like black wheels on the silver black interior, um, all blacked out. Um, I'd probably go sports exhaust. Um, I wouldn't, I, I'm not a tech guy. So if I could opt out of all that tech crap, I would not get any of that tech in the car. Mm -hmm. Definitely manual transmission, um, with the car. And I would, and I would immediately actually take the car and go get the inserts put in the Pepita insert yeah. inserts on that. And I think that combo would be killer with yeah, like silver, black interior, black wheels on that car. Probably, and, and in going back to the sports exhaust comment that I made, I would make sure whatever dynamic of that I had to go with, yeah. I would pick it that. For yeah. You. yeah. So if I, if I could go with my own exhaust, I would prefer to do that. Um, and I would just straight pipe the car and I would figure out, you know, probably Cobb tune or somebody like that's going to come out with a really good tune where you can do a sneaky tune where it doesn't show that you're in there and you're piggyback tuning. So if something does go wrong yeah. you can take that out of the car put me? the stock exhaust back on it and then take it into the dealership yeah. and be like hey i don't know your car grenaded <laughs> and then like really <laughs> it has nothing to do with you turning it up another 150 horsepower and be like absolutely not uh, as we can see here wait a minute you can see that yeah exactly that's that's yeah. what i'm talking about is like to make sure that yeah. it's you're not being tracked while you're in there and you have to be crafty with that software like, so they're like oh man we noticed there was a tune in there oh you saw the tune Oh, no, we did, yeah. but now we know. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, interesting thing about this car, it's limited at 187 miles an hour. It data logged you at 207. So how is that possible unless you have unlocked the computer? Mm. Cheat codes. It's fast car, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Downhill. Yeah. yeah it, is. it was legit, man. It's from the factory. But yeah, that would be my spec. Um, silver, huh? Yeah, yeah. I beg you as a silver person. I'm not. I'm not a silver car guy, but like, I think there's a time and place for a silver car. And I think that's one, one it would be. And if not silver, obviously I know it, it's a base car, so you're not going to get any of those juicy colors. I'd actually prefer to do like a chalk or something like that, but you're not going <laughs> to get gonna, that. You're just gonna, can I have my, can I have a PTS? Yeah. Can I get a base PTS? Is that a thing? They're like, it can be <laughs> <laughs> if you want to pay up and you're like, eh, that doesn't really make sense. But, um, uh, yeah, that's probably my spec. One of one. Yeah. So let's talk about this real quick, and then we'll close with an interesting topic. C8 mid-engine Corvette versus Porsche. That motor trend is already can't wait to, to yeah. make this comparison, but I've we'll talk about so that in a second. A, there's a new Corvette out, huh? Yeah. No, none of us have heard about that. I heard right? anything about it. So as a reminder, we do YouTube videos, right? So yeah. um, they come out every Monday and Friday, yeah. and then obviously these come out on YouTube as well that you're listening to. You don't necessarily have to watch them. We would appreciate it if you did. But the main thing is, is make sure you guys subscribe because I know there's yeah. a ton of people on here that are listening right now that maybe didn't even realize that we're doing car reviews on Friday, we're doing vlogs on Monday. Uh, please give us a look and go ahead and subscribe there because it helps us out. Yeah. Um, we can definitely know. see through our stats that 
there's a that giant gap in between people that are just watching it. Mm -hmm. And then versus actually subscribed. Yeah, we got a lot of people viewing, but not a lot of people subscribing. So a couple reasons why subscribing helps, right? So we need to get to at least a thousand subscribers because that helps us from a monetization standpoint mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, that's just be totally blunt there. You yeah. want like we're providing content for you. You're watching it. Please help us out. That, it doesn't cost you anything to subscribe, but literally a millisecond for you to click on the thing. So and then you get to see more portions. Hook stuff. a brother up, right? So on the flip side of that, we've implemented our own thing where we're saying every time we click over a thousand subscribers, if you're one of those subscribers, we're going to pull somebody's name out randomly and give you away something, give you guys something yeah. from that for for our appreciation, whether it be decals, hats, shirts, whatever. Um, but every time it's not just for the 1000, but every time we click over a thousand. So tell your brothers, tell your cousins, tell your mamas, your aunts, whatever, everybody can win free stuff, but it also helps you when you sub, I don't, and there's a lot of people that aren't educated about YouTube and how YouTube works. If you subscribe, yep. it ends up showing up in your feed when a new video comes out from us. So you don't have to search us and see what's going on. It just automatically comes up when you log into YouTube. And then there's the bell too. So if you click on the bell, mm -hmm. then you get notified immediately when something drops. Exactly. So that's your tutorial guys, because there's a lot of guys out there that are listening to us all over the world. And we love you guys. We're in over 69 countries. Aha, 69. Yeah. What? But <laughs> anyways, I'm a child, but anyways, seriously guys, hook it up. Um, it doesn't cost you anything. It's free to subscribe. And additionally, if you're listening to this too now and you're not subscribing on whatever platform you're on to listen to the podcast, do us a favor too. subscribe on there. Stop trying to just pull episodes here and there. It doesn't cost you anything. This content's free, guys, yep. and we're out here hustling for you guys. The least you can do is do do us a solid and, and, and do a subscribe on the backside, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, enough of that. Enough shameless plugs, all that kind of crap. Let's talk about the C8 versus Porsche. Okay. Is this ridiculous or what? I mean, every time, like, <laughs> well, I mean, something new tries to come out and challenge the champ. Yeah, I mean, it's like, for good reason. We it's, it's the bar. Yeah, it's like... You know, you're at the top of the mountain and then these like pipsqueaks are always coming up trying to like knock you off. And you're like, really, guys? Like, this is what you brought to fight with? Exactly. All right. Die. Yeah. You know, so. And they're not winning races for no reason. So. Yeah. But I think, you know, not to harp on, you know, and go to. They're making some outlandish claims, right? As far as C8 goes. Mm -hmm. um, what they're capable of doing. Uh, and, and from a st statistical st standpoint, you know, like zero to 60 times and what they think the zero to 100 and back to zero breaking to things are and all this kind of stuff. Um, so do we think where I'm going with this is, do we think this is going to be a good contender in EMSA racing with the mid engine Corvette? Are they going to be more competitive now as opposed to getting like stomped out with their front engine car? Well, it is a change and quite a large one. Mm -hmm. uh, I would hope that they did this, I mean, I'm sure they did all their engineering research, that this was the step they had to take to for them to even be competitive anymore. I think mm -hmm. they, had, they had reached the limits of what that, that where platform could do. was at. As far as weight, where the engine sat, as far back, I mean, because that motor and those cars were still coming, mm -hmm. coming back, but there's only so far back it can go until you go <laughs> to... Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what they bring to the fight in, in the far as EMSA season next year with this car. I think with anything, anytime you have a new chassis car, I think there's going to be growing pains. The 24-hour race is going to show that. For of sure. course. I mean, even a 12-hour race is going to show that. Yeah. So we're going to see what this car is really made of. And I mean, I don't want to say that, oh, this car can't be dominant. It certainly has the potential to be, right? right? Mm -hmm. But so does Lamborghini. So does Ferrari. So does Audi. And why do they, why are they not podiuming every time? It's true. And we talked about this at breakfast today a little bit. This is the first time that Chevy's made a, uh, a mid engine car. So there's just going to be growing pains in general with that, where they're figuring things out. Like you can do as much R and D as you want. But the fact is, is when you're not putting the, the car through the actual rigors of it day in and day out and the racing and all that kind of stuff, you really don't know what you have yep. until you actually go out there and do it. So it could be a total success and it could be a total bomb. Um, I think it'll land somewhere in between. But nevertheless, I think it'll be interesting. 
and where I was going with that with when we talked about breakfast, we talked about those those companies that I already mentioned that are making mm-hmm. in mid-engine cars, right? And they've been doing it for a while. Years and years. So yeah. they've got their mid-engine balance dialed in, their mm-hmm. mid-engine power dialed in, and they're still not podiuming. Yep. So for... I just don't see like, okay, this is the answer. Okay, now we just needed a mid-engine car. Now we're going to dominate in the racing world. Yeah. That Now this is the it. Okay, well, what about all these other cars that are mid-engine that have been making mid-engine <laughs> engines just... way longer than you, 20-plus years, 30-plus years, yeah. and they've been racing those cars, and they're not dominating. I just wonder if anybody like, brought that up in a meeting, like, um, so, yeah. Yeah. We're not the only ones here. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, just heads up, uh, we're about 35 years late to the race with the mid-engine thing in racing scene. Just FYI. You, guy who raised your hand, you're fired. <laughs> okay, I no. guess I'm out of here. Go work for one of the other mid-engine guys that is doing better. But So do you think they'll take this technology, and I know we talked about uh, maybe a flagship car. Do you think they take this and make a, make a hyper car? Absolutely. I, I think that this is the 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 precursor to that mm. because this is the only way they could make a hyper car that made sense because they still want to sell these cars yep. but they want those people that are buying those cars to daisy chain themselves to this halo car that they're going to make like our 918 exactly right so you the, your gt3 guys are like well you know well there's lineage here you know we're all in the same family you know i can't afford the million dollar car but hey i can afford you know two hundred thousand dollar car and I think they're, you know, not that the, the C8 is going to be that, but maybe the Z06 becomes that $100,000 car for them. And then they have a halo car. It's in the three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 range, you know, that maybe tries to be their fighter against the Ford GT yeah. and all these other cars that are going to be coming out in 2021 that are going to be in this hypercar series. I'm sure Corvette's done this push now yep. because they want to compete in that series. They want to compete in the 2021 hypercar series. But they still haven't accounted for the Porsche's 917. That's just no one has. Clean house. No one has. Who else is going to fight with that car? I don't think anybody. I think they've been developing it for so long under the under oh, wraps. The Germans are sneaky, dude. That, so. car's all, that car's probably ready to race now. And they're just underplaying it. Oh, it's, these this prototypes. It's just nothing, nothing's wrong. And then you <laughs> just, run. everybody leaves and it's like, somebody's hiding in the room and they fire it up. They're like, I thought you said that was a roller. And they're like, so get him out of here now. <laughs> We're just moving it. Yeah. But, um, of course that car is going to dominate, but you know, the, to be fair to the entire market and not just because we're, we're Porsche fanboys, but there's going to be, there's going to be stiff competition in there because you think about the cars that are going to, that's going to be the class right now. Let's, let's be honest. The GTLM class is mm-hmm. the class in EMSA. Yep. And EMSA wants to change that. Not that they don't like the bond that the fans have with that. It's just recognizable. But it's not their it's not their top tier class, right? Their 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 hybrid class or their prototype class is supposedly supposed to be their their class. Yep. But no one cares about that. That's like too genuinely. Yep. Like cause no one can relate to that. Because those are prototype cars that are running like funky chassis and they're never you're never going to see that stuff maybe it trickles down to the cars eventually but you don't get to connect the dots as a fan yep. now when you see a, ni- a new 917 running or if they make a gt1 a new gt1 or something whatever they make and it's competing against you know for example like a koning sag yep. that's in that class or the lamborghini hypercar it's in that class and the ferrari hypercar it's in that class and whoever else is competing in that class like that's the king of the kings right there fight. Yep. And that's going to become a very exciting series. And don't get me wrong, the GTLM cars are still going to have their day in the sun because they're going to be out there on the track together. That's the great thing about EMSA is they're on the track together. But I think it's going to bring in a lot more people and excitement that they've lost over the years by running these prototype cars. That's just me. And, I, and that's why they're doing it. I mean, Sir Derek Bell said that. Yeah hands down and I, I know all you guys know who Derek Bell is he flat out said his own opinion he goes I think that part of EMSA is not exciting to watch and EMSA knows it so that's why they're changing it and I think it's going to bring it's, it back yeah it's going to revolutionize that that section of racing it's going to essentially be the golden years of racing again just in the modern era 
but you know, I know I kind of we spun off yeah, into EMSA there. So back to the benchmark of the nine eleven versus. The yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you know, sorry guys about that tangent that we spun off there on. Again, like I think that Porsche is always the benchmark, right? It's always the one that everybody wants to test their their counter car against. Like, okay, I'm going to counter Porsche. So in a way, it's flattering. Because everybody always wants to knock the king off the hill. Everybody always wants to be like, "Oh, my my mid engine cars cost sixty thousand, and it's going to knock your ninety eight thousand dollar car's head off." Okay, cool. That you know, we don't sell the jean short New Balance starter kit with our cars <laughs> and put them in the trunk. Like you're selling to a mass market, you've knocked your pricing down substantially for your own reason. Even with that, even if you get the upgraded seat. Uh, C8 with some other amenities. I mean, your car's probably going to be 75000 before you walk out the door, realistically. Yeah. So now we're talking a little bit closer, you know, obviously 98000 78000 that's still $23,000 difference. However, at the end of the day, as we all know, you can go on Auto Trader if even if you're interested, and it's common knowledge, those things sink like boat anchors as far as, like, resellability uh, after yeah. time. Yeah. Like, D-bat after D-bat a generation, you know, look at a Corvette that's two or three generations separated and see how much that car is. And then look at what that car retailed for. And, the, and what is really calling those cars as being, like, a feature classic either. I, I mean, nobody's like, oh, that's going to be. Of course. It's, it's just now it's become, what's the new thing out? Well, the thing is, is when you make 250000 of one car. There's just no way yeah. that it can be special. It just can't be, you know. And and the reason why early Corvettes are special is because they didn't make that many of them. <laughs> just like anything else, yeah. And so, I was gonna say. So, do you think it's the, a proper benchmark is the 2020 911 that nobody has can test against the C8? What do you? I think this is an. I don't think this is a fair fight for yeah. either car because this doesn't make sense. And now, to be fair, who's who's making this comparison is Motor Trend. Yeah. This isn't Chevy saying this, and this isn't Porsche saying this. This is an editing firm who has made a headline to get eyes yeah. to look at it. So let that be clear. You know, neither one of these manufacturers are, are trying to pin them against each other, but that's not going to stop uh, people from making interesting news or the catch line or the clickbait or whatever you want to call it for them to say C8 versus Porsche. It's not, if you really break it down, that makes zero sense. Because you're going to have a naturally aspirated car go against a turbocharged car, a mid-engine car going against a rear-engine car, but they're benchmarking against Porsche because Porsche is so good. That's why they're doing it, because it's the sports car that everybody goes after. And then they're, and I'm sure this article, I can write this article before even they do any testing. Oh my God, the C8! Can you believe it? This car, you know, with options and everything, comes in at seventy-two thousand dollars and pulls 1.8 G and walks laps around the Porsche. Why would you ever buy a Porsche? Why wouldn't you buy a C8? Well, you know why? It's because that C8 is going to be worth dog crap in literally like five or six years. And we'll see how well the interiors hold up and all that stuff. And additionally, all of the additional things that people like when they write those articles don't talk about. When you take your C8 in, I want you to close your eyes and think about this. You take your car in, you're in the service bay, you get out of your car, and you open your eyes, and there's a Chevy Sonic sitting in front of you waiting to get serviced right behind you, or, or you're right behind it on your C8, and you get out of that car at the Chevy dealership. That is never going to happen to you at a Porsche dealership. Nope. And that is one of the major reasons, and I know that sounds super pretentious, but do you want your, somebody who works on Sh- Chevy Sonics to work on your Corvette? Yep, they're probably the same level of care. They probably need. Or a Silverado to work on your Corvette. No. Yeah, it's just not a special. I mean, they're not. It's something they do, but not something. That and I they think are. that's where Chevy really, really falls short. They want this car to be that special. If you mm-hmm. and not this particular one, but just their Corvette in general. You want the Corvette to be really special. You need to make service centers just for Corvettes. And I know that's going to cost them a lot yeah. of money, but you do have to make that separation because you just can't. Like, and, and I have a friend that has owned every generation of Corvette since he's graduated from college. So that's starting with like the C5 Mm -hmm. and he's a diehard Chevy guy always has been, but he loves Corvettes and he just always buys the new one. It comes out. And I always make that argument to him. I, and I say to him, I go, well, how do you, how do you feel about when you take your car in and 
there's like a 2011 Chevy, Chevy Silverado 4x4 in front of you, and you're both going into service bay together. He's like, it sucks. I hate it. And he's like, but I still like them. Yeah. So even from a customer standpoint, he doesn't like that. And I'm not saying that's the reason why you shouldn't buy it, but there's just, you know where I'm going with this. It's just one of those things that, I don't know, it's just, Oops, there's, it's, oh, it's, it's always going to be, it's, Personal. they don't even cover it. They do when they don't. Like, they, they say mixed things. When I say they, I'm talking about Chevy. Mm. They say, oh, well, it's the most affordable sports car and the most bang for the buck, and it does all these amazing things, and it does this, 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 and this. And we're going to price it at 60000 so everybody can get the car. And we're going to make a gazillion of them. Mm. Okay, well, if it's that special, like, why don't you limit them some? And, like, why don't you pump up the price a little bit? Like, how much money are you? Are you guys making any money on these? Yeah, that's what I, I mean. That and then just all the all the new options they have. I don't know if they're new options, but it seems like there are a lot, there are a lot more options to, uh, yeah. to do this time than there have been in the past. Mm-hmm. And then I think you brought up too. They're they're not doing chrome wheels this time for the yeah. state. Not that anybody cares in this podcast. But. Yeah, they're not even an option. Even if you wanted them, you can't get them from the factory. So that just shows you. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because that that opens up another page that I was thinking about. And that has and if there are baby boomers listening, this trust me, I don't mean any any offense by this by any means. And you're Porsche people anyway, so this so don't get any offense by this. But like Chevy has seen the writing on the wall, right? Their generation is flipping over. They don't really care almost anymore about the baby boomers as far as buying their cars because they are solely targeting basically, you know, people from the ages 35 and up now Mm -hmm. because they know those are their next gen of buyers. So they're not, they're really not listening to the next gen, you know, the the current gen who's, you know, in their late 60s, early 70s, whatever. They're just saying, look, man, you guys probably aren't going to buy this car anyway. So I'm sorry if you have some hurt feelings over this, but. Enjoy whatever you have and just see you later. And, and that's and that's totally reflected because I saw a, a, a thing about deposits. It said that 50% of the people that are buying the new C8, the mid-engine one, are, uh, 50% of their pos- deposits are for people uh, under 40 years old. So they, they hit a home run because that's what they were going after. They were going after that demographic of people. So kudos to them on that. Yeah. But again, this is not a Chevy show, so who gives a crap really? <laughs> Um, any, any day of the week, like this thing, even if it outperforms Porsche on paper, it means nothing to me. And I'm sure it means nothing to you guys because the, it'd be a cold day in hell before I pick a, a Corvette over a Porsche. Yep. I mean, I would pick the slowest Porsche in the world to drive instead of a Corvette any day of the week. You know, I'd pick a 914 1.7 liter to drive daily before I would pick like the C8 to drive. And that's just the way I'm cut. He that's just the way a, I, he would get it full EV'd. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that crap we talked about earlier. Yeah, full EV mode, four hundred, you know, four thousand five hundred puts of torque. What do you want, bro? Get some. But anyways, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we look forward to hearing from you guys on all the topics that we talked about. Make sure that you comment. Um, tell tell your friends. Spread the word. Uh, we're growing and continuing to grow because of you guys out there and you guys yeah. spreading the word. And keep doing that. Um, and join the army. And we love you guys so, so much out there and so thankful and so humble for everything that you guys are doing for us on your front. And we will see you on the next one. Yep, see ya. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of PCAR Talk. Connect with us on Instagram at PCAR Talk or online at PCARTalk.com.